So my name is Jess Bayada Silva, and I am advised by my professor, Ann Short, and we are going to talk about climate change and justice in cities and equity. So all of these terms are a lot to unpack, and I understand that, so we're going to go each of them step by step and really just focus on each specific aspect of my research. So why are we looking at cities specifically and their networks? So for the longest time in history, cities have been the ones acting on top of climate change. They have been on the forefront of it. They are the ones in integrating the most extreme plans, the most radical, because they have, you know, they're localized to their specific situation in cities, and they are the ones who really know their situation best. They also have a long le legacy of justice within their plans because, again, of that local context. Why networks specifically? Networks are these groups of cities banding together on these certain principles of including justice in their plans or making sure that they are the ones approaching climate change together, sharing those best practices, sharing information so that they can together really improve the situation of climate change. So for our project specifically, we are focusing on the mitigation side of climate change plans. So for those who don't know, mitigation versus adaptation is best thought of lessening the impact of climate change versus adapting or changing to fit climate change. So for example, mitigation would be planting trees so you can get rid of the carbon in the atmosphere versus trying to raise your buildings to be at a higher level of um, elevation so that they're not going to get slipped away by sea level rise. So there is a huge gap in the literature for specifically looking at justice in mitigation plans, and we are hoping to fill that with this study. So the main research questions that we're looking at are, how has justice been articulated and integrated into climate mitigation documents? Is membership in these urban sustainability networks correlated to having greater attention to justice? And then how and why has justice evolved in climate mitigation activities? And how is it put into practice? So to answer these three questions, we need to talk about what justice is. So justice is this very lofty term. And dependent on your discipline, dependent on your information, it can have very different meanings. So for some people, justice is that old brand from when we were 10 years old, um, selling those glittery backpacks and all of those weird quiche things. For other people, that might be the penal system, getting just, getting just um, punishment for your actions or for your crimes. But for our scope of the project, we're gonna be talking about the scales of justice and really talking about the equity and making sure that those scales are balanced between the two sides. So. For our specific definition, we're going to be using the philosopher Rawls definition of justice, which is the allocation of best benefit to the most disadvantaged. And then we're going to look at different dimensions of justice as well. So based on the environmental justice literature, there's three different dimensions that we will be focusing on. First is distributional, second is procedural, and third is recognition-based. So to talk about what those mean, so distribution is making sure that everyone is getting the same benefit or the same um, cost that is going to be distributed to each population the same, not having it on one side being totally aggregated or on the other side being totally aggregated. We're making sure that it's all equal. The second is procedural, so we want to recognize people for you know where they are and how like recognize people and make sure that they are actually being incorporated into the process and making sure that everyone has equal access to that procedural process and making sure that the government is the one who's actually distributing the risk. And then finally we're looking at recognition based, so we're recognizing people for where they are and for who they are. So we're making sure that everyone is being incorporated into our plans and making sure that they're all recognized for what they're doing. So justice is highly varied and it depends from city to city on how it's expressed, but there has been a history of justice within climate plans and this is ultimately a pivotal moment in history for cities to recognize these, or like to take this moment and use it as a transformative moment. So for our specific study, these are what we did for our methods. We chose 24 cities, 12 of them being C40 and 12 of them being non-C40. Ultimately, through our analysis, because some cities didn't have their climate plans ready for our time of analysis, we ended up reducing it down to 21 cities. Um, each plan was uploaded and coded within Invivo, which is the software that you can use to highlight and code different things and use it for different subsections. And then we used a hierarchy to code that all of those plans. So if there was like a definition, we coded that as a certain definition. And if it was in a specific location and what have you. And then finally, we had a case study in Portland, Oregon. So we wanted to use that case study to answer the third question of, you know, how has justice evolved and been articulated in plans over time? And we, we used Portland to show that as an example. So for the content analysis, so this was the part where we were looking into each plan and coding them in vivo. Um, justice was specifically used as distributive justice. That was the most prominent form that was shown. It was most um, common in the art, like, actions and implementation section of all of the different plans. So this shows us that there is 
constant employment of justice, but it's also being concretely used. Because if it's in the actions and implementation sections, that means that it's actually being used as a goal in their plans and an actionable thing. Um, However, when we compared the two different groups of C40 and non-C40, we were able to see that justice was more articulated within the climate plans of the C40 groups is more woven in and more integrated as opposed to being used as a bu buzzword in the non-C40 cities. So I just wanted to show examples of what C40 and non-C40 plans look like. So for C40, this was New York's 1.5 degrees Celsius plan. Um, I'll read it quickly to you. That equity and climate are inexorably linked. While climate change affects everyone, its impacts are not equally shared. Simply put, the poorest and the most vulnerable are hit the hardest, and therefore we work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and they must address economic and social inequities. Denver, this was just another example of what justice looked like that we coded. Equity, climate action needs to be all inclusive. Denver's climate action plans are and many key strategies that not only mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, but also provide equitable social, economic, and health benefits. So that was just an example of what we looked like when we coded. And then we moved to the case study. So this was really the brunt of the research that we ended up doing, was looking into Portland and seeing how justice has been articulated. Why we chose Portland, they have had, okay, sorry, computer. Um, Portland has been historically attentive towards climate justice and towards um, climate change and justice together. They were the most equitable plan that we analyzed. And we wanted to really just see how and why that came to be. So over the summer in August, I was able to interview four people, two of them being in the city, two of them being in the actual community advisory group. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later. But this was a timeline that we were able to derive from the interviews. So they started their climate plans in 1997, which was one of the first climate plans in the United States. In 2009, there was a release of a scathing report about equity and inclusion of equity by the city and the county by this group called the Commun Coalitions of Communities of Color. It embarrassed the city because, you know, Portland thinks of themselves as a very progressive city. And to have someone say that's not true was very embarrassing. So that was really the pivotal moment where they started to include more justice and more equity in their plans. And then from 2011 onward, you could start to see that it's starting to evolve. And by 2016, their climate plan had a uh, community advisory group implemented in it so that they actually had community members representing various organizations of um, communities to come and talk about why this was working for them or wasn't working for them. So they had a direct line to the city hall workers. So to kind of highlight what happened with the case study and what they, pro they pointed as successes, challenges, and opportunities, I wanted to highlight specifically the power dynamic relation because this was, again, relating to the community advisory group that there was this great power divide between them when they first started, where the city hall workers were there bringing the policies to the community advisory groups, but they weren't necessarily the ones leading the charge. It was kind of just like they were there as like a yes, no group instead of actually doing some implementing and changing. So they ended up changing, like, the community advisory group and the community members decided to talk to the city hall workers and say, you know, this power dynamic is very unequal and we want it to be a little more leveled. And they were really, you know, responsive to that and changed it so that the community members were the ones leading it and they were the ones coming week by week with things to talk about and what to do, as opposed to the city hall worker just saying, like, this is the policy, and they going, yay or nay. And then ultimately, the issue became, that was a success. The challenge became the fact that this was something that wasn't going to be continued. So funding is obviously a huge problem in cities. There are always issues with money and budgets. And Portland ultimately got money from an outside source to fund that community advisory group. And when that money ran out, that was the end of the community advisory group. And the group wanted to continue to do the work on all different policies and not just focus on climate change policies. But because there was no funding, they really couldn't continue that work. And it ultimately ended. And a lot of the interviewees expressed um, you know, being a little upset that that was the case because they really thought that this was great work that they were doing and they thought that it should continue. But other successes and other challenges and opportunities, one other success was that community groups are starting to create their own climate change plans. They are the one, they took the information learned from that community advisory group and they're starting to implement it in their own groups. The other challenge is that, you know, the power dynamics are still askew between the city and the community groups are still this dynamic that's not really equalized, even though they had that talk at the beginning. Um, and future opportunities, they're able to create, they want to really just like work to create this permanent group. So they want to continue this work so that they can finally get some budget money and make it permanent. And they also want to continue to support community initiatives towards sustainability. 
So overall, my conclusions, the justice was majority was distributional justice, and it was included in the actions and implementation plans, showing that there is a concrete action towards justice. However, there's a huge difference between C40 and non-C40 cities. C40s were more attentive towards justice. They had it more interwoven within their plans and shows a more basis within it. And then finally, to answer our third research question, justice and inclusion are involved in three different parts due to history, community input, and commitment to equity. And that's all I have. So I will take any questions, but I want to give a special thanks to Kilachand and also to the Initiative of Cities for funding this project. Thanks.